The Kentucky Derby, called the most exciting two minutes in sports, was also pretty cruel to the winner this year. After the race, it's all people are talking about, how winner Rich Strike was punched repeatedly afterwards. Next, on The PETA Podcast. Welcome to The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host for this inside look at animal rights. Brought to you by PETA, the largest animal rights organization in the world. On today's episode, horse racing's Triple Crown has begun with the Kentucky Derby on the first Saturday in May. But instead of the buzz being about whether the winner, Rich Strike, might win the next two legs, the Preakness and the Belmont, the talk on social media is how Rich Strike appeared to be punched by an outrider at the end of the race. More and more people are questioning horse racing and starting to see the sport from a whole new perspective. The horse's perspective. The animal's perspective. And that's why the 2022 Kentucky Derby was unusual. NBC, which covered the race, couldn't ignore that the sport's biggest name, trainer Bob Baffert, had been banned from the Kentucky Derby for rules violations involving drugs and horses, specifically last year's disqualified winner, Medina Spirit. PETA's senior vice president, Kathy Guillermo, talks about how PETA's efforts have made people more aware about the animals than ever before. This year, that includes how the Derby's long-shot winner, Rich Strike, was punched. Well, this was a surprise to everybody. Of all the things that I thought might go wrong at the world's most famous horse race, this was not one of them. This horse, Rich Strike, came from far behind. He was not expected to be anywhere near first at the finish line, and he passed by all of the favorites. He won the race. When he came off the track, he was a little bit agitated, still keyed up, crowds roaring. And the person who's called the outrider, and, and this is a person on a horse who comes basically to gather the winner and lead him over to where the jockey can be interviewed by NBC News in this case. And when he began to lead the horse forward as probably many people who are listening to this podcast might have heard, the horse became a little bit irritated. The outrider began jerking on his chain. The horse became even more irritated, began to bite at both the outrider and the horse that the outrider was on. And the outrider, it looks like to anybody who sees that video, began hitting and punching this horse to try to make him behave. Now I saw and, the, I, I saw the video. It was actually like, I mean, it's pretty normal for an outrider to try to rein in a horse and pull a horse in. I mean, he, he did that at least well, right? I mean, that was not too out of the ordinary. I don't think he did it well. No, I, in fact, I think that contributed to why the horse was upset. Because it seemed to me, if you go back and you look at the video from the very start, when he first came up to the horse, he grabbed him pretty quickly, pretty tersely. And I think the problems began there. Yeah, because I, I, I don't know anything from, you know, out riding to, you know, whether he did something good or bad. But I can tell if you punch a horse, that doesn't look very good. And it looked like he was punching the horse with his fist. Yes, he resorted to violence. And that was a huge mistake, both from the standpoint of the horse and from the standpoint of Churchill Downs and what is seen on national television. And so what should have happened? I mean, I, I, get, I gather these outriders are trained. What should have happened? Well, you know, the reason I wanted to talk to you about this today is that there's one point of view in this whole story, which has been discussed on Twitter and over the newscasts and on the Today Show. And every time the trainer is interviewed, what is not discussed is really what is happening from the horse's point of view. And you have to think about this like you're a horse and not like you're a better or a fan or somebody involved in racing or a trainer or an outrider. This horse did not ask to be in this race. He didn't ask to be put through the starting gate. 
He didn't ask to spend 23 hours a day in a stall in a barn. He didn't ask to be whipped. These are all things that he's coerced into doing. These are things that are done to him that he has no control over. And he comes out of this race and here comes somebody cantering toward him, rather perhaps from his point of view, aggressively. The crowd is screaming because this this horse who whose name nobody even knew has won the race. Yeah, he's a little angry and a little upset and a little agitated. And at that point, what would have been appropriate would be a de-escalation technique, technique on the part of the outrider. He shouldn't have escalated the situation by jerking on that chain and trying to make him behave. So there are a couple of things just quickly. He should have had protective gear on his horse. If you see other outriders, you'll see that they have they have a kind of a shield that goes on the side of the horse to protect him from, from a thoroughbred who might be biting him. He should have had on a pair of chaps, which is a you know a piece of clothing that covers the legs so that if the horse tried to bite the outrider, which in this case, Rich Strike did, it would have protected him from that. That's the first thing. He should have gone in with the proper equipment. And the second thing is that when the horse was so excitable, he probably should have let him go and let the jockey canter him around a little bit, take a little bit more time to calm down. He just needed a little bit more time to calm down. The exact wrong thing to do, and I say this not only from my experience with horses, but from talking to people who are in the racing world, what's the right thing to do? The racing world's at war at itself over whether he did the right thing or the wrong thing. But the people I respect and the people I spoke with said he did the wrong thing. And and so what's interesting is you're right. Most people talk about it from the standpoint of, uh, people in the audience, the viewing audience, the horseman, uh, the jockey, the owner. From the human perspective, no one's looking at it from the horse's perspective. Here is a horse that just was sent off at 80 to 1 in the most famous race in the world. The longest shot on the board, 80 to 1, and it wins. It beat tremendous odds to win the race, and he gets treated like this. I mean, that's... That tells you something about this thing they call a sport. You know, I spoke with people who were at the race. They were there at Churchill Downs. And there was a tremendous excitement because, as as we've pointed out a couple of times now, nobody knew who Rich Strike is. You know, he was not a famous horse. He was not expected to win. And there was a great excitement in the crowd because a lot of people like racing for this reason. You never know what's going to happen. But when it showed on the big, huge TV screen at the track that the outrider was jerking on his bridle like that and and jerking at his mouth, I was told that there was a collective sudden silence and intake of breath because people were horrified. And as somebody on Twitter said, you know, talking about it now, not from the horse's point of view, but from the point of view of the horse racing industry, as somebody on Twitter said, well, that's a rule that shouldn't have been broken, hitting a horse on national television. The irony, of course, of that is they hit all of those horses as they were going down the the, the, the final stretch of the race. They were all being whipped. Yeah. Does it surprise you that uh, this kind of reaction has become kind of the dominant point of conversation after the race? I mean, I be, they saw it. People were, if you were a horse race fan or just a casual fan, People noticed it. It was talked about in social media. People saw it on, on on the telecast, which I understand was seen by about 16 million viewers. But does it surprise you that people have this reaction to that as opposed to the entire race? It doesn't surprise me anymore. If this had happened 15 years ago, I, I would have fainted, I think. I, I certainly would have been very shocked. But no, it doesn't surprise me anymore because the public is not going to stand by when they perceive that a horse is being abused in or after or around a horse race. And there are a lot of people in racing who are very vocal about this as well. There were a lot of people in racing condemning the actions of this outrider. And you mentioned the outrider. Uh, For PETA, the identity of the outrider figures into this story. Who is he and why does it matter? Well, the outrider is a man named Greg Blasey. 
And I have heard from people that he's typically a good outrider, but our supporters may remember the name Blasey because Greg Blasey's brother, Scott Blasey, is an assistant trainer for Steve Asmussen. And our listeners may remember the 2013 investigation, which was released in spring of 2014, of Steve Asmussen's barn. And Scott Blasey, the brother of the outrider, figured very prominently in that investigation and was known for his outbursts. And he swore quite a bit. He got angry quite a bit. Last year, he was fined and suspended for something that was described only as a physical altercation, which I take to mean a fight with somebody, a physical fight with somebody. And so we did have to wonder a couple of things. First, does the Blasey family have trouble controlling their anger? That's the first thing I would wonder. And the second thing is, was Greg Blasey upset? Because Epicenter, who is the horse who was the favorite, was predicted to win the Derby, is trained by Steve Asmussen, for whom his brother works. And it's interesting you mentioned Epicenter, because from the aerial point of view, it looked like in deep stretch, Epicenter was clearly the horse that was going to go on to win the Derby, running down the middle of the racetrack, when suddenly, out of nowhere, really, literally out of nowhere, which sounds like a cliche, but really, Rich Strike came out of nowhere on the rail, like on the two path, off the rail, had a clear path to win, was driving and caught Epicenter and the other horse that was running in the deep stretch, Zandon, to beat both horses at 80 to 1. So I had to figure if, you know, maybe Greg Blasey had a few dollars on his brother's horse. Yeah, I, I couldn't, couldn't speak to that. But I did wonder, before I even knew who he was, I did wonder when he approached Rich Strike, the winning horse, and he grabbed him so roughly, I did kind of wonder, you yeah. know, is he angry and who is this guy? And the person I work with at PETA on horse racing emailed me right at that moment and said, that's Scott Blasey's brother. I couldn't believe it. Well, you know what happens when, I mean, in paramutual betting at the racetrack, you're betting against other bettors and your money that you know, that you bet on a horse, uh, if your horse loses, the other better who has the winning ticket gets your money. And, you know, that's the way, you know, racetrack betting, paramutual wagering works. So uh, I it, it would stand to reason that Greg Blasey would be a little upset that his, you know, here's this horse that, you know, upset his, Daily double, his trifectas, his exactas, all the bets that you can make at a racetrack. Um, anyway, uh, so this is the big story out of out of the uh, out of the Kentucky Derby. But there were other big stories. First of all, uh, what about the drug situation? Did uh, were, were horses restricted this year? Was there anything about uh, limiting or? You know, change. Was there anything changed about what drugs could be administered to the horses? No, there were no changes from last year. I think, at least so far, what is different from last year is that it does not appear, or at least if it has happened, it hasn't been released yet, that any horse has been found to have an illegal substance or uh, a substance that's not supposed to be in his body in his body. And that's a good thing because you may remember last year that Medina Spirit tested positive for dexamethasone in his system. He would, that medication is prohibited on race day. And that created the entire scandal and controversy around Bob Baffert, who was this year banned from Churchill Downs. He's banned for two years from Churchill Downs. He's on suspension for that drug positive. Medina Spirit was disqualified from winning the Kentucky Derby last year. And again, I always have to think of this from the horse's point of view. Medina Spirit died last fall. Yeah. Yeah. And so Baffert was not there, but the horses he trained were there, but they didn't have Baffert's name attached to them. There was another trainer, an assistant to Baffert. Does that really make a difference at all? I mean, the the owners who had horses under Baffert were able to 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 race. They lost, but 
they were able to be there. Well, just to be strictly clear about this, the horses were not transferred from Baffert to an assistant, but to somebody who was an assistant for him in the past, no longer works for him. The The mandate was that the horses could not have that, that Bob Baffert could not have anything to do with the horses. So they went to a trainer named Tim Yachtin. My understanding is they had all the same grooms and they had the same uh, other workers who whom the horses are used to but the trainer was different and i don't know what happened but the horses did not uh as you pointed out did not win the race and they've n- now announced that those horses will not be in the preakness in two weeks and what's the significance of that i mean the preakness is the next leg of the triple crown uh you go on if you're well in good shape you go on if you win certainly the horses didn't does that do you read anything into that hard to say uh i think these races are are very stressful for horses it's a pretty long distance first of all there's a lot of excitement that surrounds what goes on at the track it makes the horses quite nervous and uptight and of course the race itself is very demanding so it could be that the horses just are not physically up to racing in two weeks um, it could be that the owners want to wait until Baffert is back in three months. Really difficult to say. But also it could mean that whatever Baffert did with the horses, either legal or illegal, can't be done now and horses aren't winning. I think the most cynical among us would certainly say that that could be a factor. <laughs> well, I only mention that because whenever you have someone who is seen as the face of horse racing banned, well, that's a that's a major black eye to the sport when the the face of racing, the most famous trainer, living trainer right now, is seen as a villain. Well, that's quite ironic, Emil, because if you look at the trainers who were represented at the Kentucky Derby, you know, we had Chad Brown who had a horse there. Chad Brown was in trouble with the Department of Labor in I believe it was 2019 had to pay something like half a million dollars or more uh, in order to settle labor disputes because there were workers who uh, were on temporary visas in the U.S. working for him, and you know he wasn't paying them what they were supposed to have. Uh, you have Doug O'Neill, who had a horse there, who's got a long history of medication violations. And of course, Steve Asmussen. I mean, Google Asmussen PETA video investigation and you'll see exactly what our complaint with him is. And he also has labor violations. So one of the issues in horse racing, in addition to what it does to horses, is that just about everybody's a bad guy these days. Well, what's interesting is as you read off the litany there or, or you know, speak about all these other trainers, it's almost like it's not enough that Baffert is, was banned and gone. Maybe the others should have been at least, you know, have an asterisk next to their name about all the things they may have done in the past. To be very fair, there are a lot of people in horse racing, owners and trainers, who have been saying this. They have been saying for quite some time, at least going back to the time that PETA began exposing the cruelties in horse racing, that if they didn't get rid of the bat, what they call the bad players, you know, the people who break the rules or the people who bend the rules or the people who don't make sure that their horses avoid the slaughterhouse, that if they don't take care of that, it's going to ruin horse racing. But then you have all of the people who like that system and want to keep it going. And those two sides have been at war with each other. And that brings us to where we are today, where there is so much wrong. They haven't really dealt with it as effectively as they could. I think they're trying in some places like California, but, but in the end, you know, as long as a horse is harmed or as long as a horse breaks a leg, or as long as trainers are suspended and fined for drug abuses, it's a problem for the industry, certainly a problem for the horses. You know, one thing I noticed about watching the Kentucky Derby on television this year, and that is they are different. The coverage is different now. Now it's almost like impossible not to talk about things that we've seen in the news just in the last few years. Things like uh, 
horses being abused or horses dying or drugs or uh, people caught because of infractions, uh, because of the use of drugs. Uh, did you notice that? And what do you think brought it about? That started in 2014. It started in 2014 with the release of our undercover investigation of trainer Steve Asmussen that I referred to earlier. It was released by the New York Times in a series of 15 articles. We had a, about a nine-minute video, which people can see online. They can see exactly what we found. It sent shockwaves through the horse racing industry because for the first time, there it was on video, the misuse of medication to keep horses running when they shouldn't be running, when they're tired, when they're sore, when they're injured, the use of anti-inflammatories, the use of, of tranquilizers, of painkillers, of thyroid medication, of all things, for horses who don't have thyroid disease, all in an effort to keep the horse out there running and hopefully on the part of the trainers, hopefully winning. And that created such a scandal that it eventually led to the introduction of federal legislation, which passed last year, uh, which should be really enforced pretty soon with some uh, regulations about the drugging of horses. And that was the beginning. And just about every year since then, there has been a scandal or something else along those lines that simply couldn't be ignored by the broadcasters. I mean, really, in the past, they would never mention any of this. And even when it was prominent in the news, they would never mention it. But now it seems it's somewhat reluctant, but they do. They do because it can't be ignored, it seems. And they couldn't ignore Bob Baffert this year. They had to discuss that, the fact that he wasn't there. And, you know, there, there are plenty of scandals about a lot of these top trainers. And for the first time, I think, well, I shouldn't say for the first time because it's really over the last several years, but over the last several years, it has become public discussion. And I think a lot of that has to do with the public itself, people not willing to look the other way any longer when they perceive an animal in a sport as being abused. Are, are public attitudes really changing toward racing? Because, I mean, the, the TV ratings seem to be up. There was... Uh, I think I saw a blood horse, uh, the, a trade publication said there was 16 million viewers based on what NBC news uh, put out preliminarily. Are public attitudes changing or where, where do you say the popularity of horse racing is in, in light of some of these revelations about the players and some of the negative things and the violations? There's no question. Public attitude is changing. And that was driven home in 2019 when there were a number of horse deaths in California and it became international news. And that was the moment that I saw the shift. And it it's follows on other changes in public attitude toward the use of animals in entertainment. What we've seen at SeaWorld with people opposing the imprisonment and the abuse of orcas and dolphins and other animals there with the ending of the Ringling Brothers Barnum and Bailey Circus, when the circus closed down, that was a, a moment that I think everybody who uses an animal in a so-called sport or entertainment uh, endeavor needs to pay attention to. There are lots of things to do in this world and going to a horse race isn't necessarily something everybody has to do. And if you look at the, the number of people who attend horse races now compared to the 1970s, when I was a, revealing my age now, a teenager, and went to horse races myself. The, the change now in the, the, the decrease in the number of people who go to races is staggering. And racing is still coming to grips with this. So we, we've come out of this derby. It, there's not a whole lot of buzz post-derby. No one talks about the hats that people are wearing. The most viral thing that come out of the Derby was the outrider beating the uh, the winner on the head. I presume the winner, Rich Strike, will run in the Preakness, and the Preakness will run in in Baltimore and at at Pimlico, uh, and the other race the, at the Belmont uh, in in New York that that will happen. So. What is your prediction for the Triple Crown going forward? Does does it survive what happened at the Derby and just go on? And then and then what happens? 
you can't predict in this in this endeavor. You just can't know. And I, I don't think we do know that Rich Strike is going to go on and run in the in the in the Preakness or in the Belmont. If there's one thing I do know, these horses are are I, you know, I'm I'm hesitating with my words here because I started to say the horses are rather delicate, but I don't really know that it's that the horses are delicate or that the lives that they lead uh mean that they're injured frequently. So it's a big unknown. It's a big unknown. And I don't know what the stories out of the Preakness or out of the Belmont are, are going to be, if we're going to see something similar. Uh, in years past, on the days of these races, though not in these races themselves, we've seen horses break legs and die. That's quite a scandal when that happens on a big racing day. And and as for the crowds, I mean, you you look at Kentucky Derby, that is the most famous horse race in the world. And I think probably Churchill Downs was was packed with people. Come back a couple of weeks from now or, or the next racing day when it's not involved with the most famous race in the world. And it might be a different different number of people, different perspective. You know, Joe Drape, who writes for the New York Times, uh, wrote a piece after the Derby saying this was a great thing for racing, that a, a, a horse who didn't qualify, he had to wait for an, another horse to scratch on Friday, and then and then Rich Strike became eligible and was able to run. He goes off at 80 to 1. He wins the race. His logic was... This is the best thing to happen to racing. Is this the best thing to happen to racing? Well, it depends on whether you're concerned about racing or you're concerned about the horses. For me, the best thing that would happen to racing is that they would figure out what the horses need and think about it from the horse's point of view. If one horse is dying, it's too many. If one horse is suffering, it's too many. The, the, I mean, let's let's face it. I, I don't want to hear ever again how much people in horse racing love their horses when they are forced to lead lives that don't acknowledge who they are. We have to know who these animals are, not just what use they are to us or how much money they're going to win. We really need to pay attention to them as fellow animals on the earth and what their needs are. And Rich Strike, do you think he'll go on to become a real champion? Because he there, there was some analysis of Rich Strike saying how much faster he was running in that last stretch and how maybe he's the surprise. Maybe Joe Drape is right that, that he's the champion. Unfortunately, no matter who the champion is, what happens to that horse in the long run is up in the air. We've seen champions slaughtered for meat in Japan. We've seen champions sent over to South Korea to be used for breeding who whose offspring all went to slaughter. I mean, in, in my mind, all the horses are champions and it has nothing to do with winning a race. PETA Senior VP Kathy Guillermo taking the animal perspective on horse racing's Triple Crown. It includes the Kentucky Derby, the Preakness, and the Belmont. For more on what the horse racing department at PETA is doing for the animals, go to PETA.org for more. And that's our show for today. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to send a link of this show to your friends. Tell them you like the PETA podcast. Contact us at PETA.org. You can find me on Twitter at Emil Amok. That's E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K. Or see my vlog at amok.com. Or see my work at ALDEF, the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund. That's at ALDEF, A-A-L-D-E-F dot org slash blog. Once again, thank you for listening. Check out all our episodes on your favorite podcast app or on Apple Podcasts, where you can rate and review the show, maybe even subscribe to it. It all helps get the word out about the issues you care about. Our music is provided by Carbon Works. Check them out on YouTube. 
and join us again next time for more insight into animal rights and the fight for a cruelty-free world on The PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo.